I'm just here to really talk about what we're doing in, in Australia. Um, I'm with the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. We're a national funding agency. We fund all of the fisheries and aquaculture research right across um, uh, Australia. So that's you know all the fishing industries and all the aquaculture sectors. Um, we provide funds to you know just address whatever priorities. And part of that is looking at uh, emerging industries. Um, so we have uh, a lot of interest over the last probably three, four years, the, like, like everywhere I guess, the interest in seaweed is um, accelerating. Um, it's become very popular uh, for a, a range of reasons that everyone in this room is probably aware of. So in um, Australia, you know, in each of the jurisdictions, you know, Tasmania, we have um, you know, aquaculture of seaweed starting to develop. Um, so in Tasmania we have licences have been granted, we've got a, a very well established salmon industry down in Tasmania, uh, plus other aquaculture sectors. So there are a lot of marine farming areas already approved and a lot of them are now adding seaweed to, to their approvals and, and permits. So also in Tasmania, we have the base of the, the offices of the Blue Economy CRC. I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. And some significant seaweed investors and, and entrepreneurs. The main one in Tasmania would be Sea Forest. And, you know, they are, um, a, you know, have raised quite a bit of money and are pushing on fairly aggressively with uh, production of asparagopsis. So they have um, taken over a, an old mussel farm. They have access to about 1,500 hectares of water already and are, are farming. Uh, last time I visited them a couple of months ago, they had a couple of hundred long lines with about each of them with about two kilometres of rope suited with asparagopsis. So they're starting to explore and you know find out what it's what's involved with farming asparagopsis out in the ocean. Uh, they have to farm theirs at a depth of five metres. Uh, they have to allow boat traffic over the top. So they've been developing systems to do that. And the harvesting systems and the extraction systems for processing, uh, extracting um, bromoform from the, the seaweed that they're growing. And you know they're providing product to do you know, terrestrial farming trials. Uh, they've raised money, other funding money for from Meat and Livestock Australia to, you know, do the terrestrial side of, you know, how their product works in uh, on, you know, methane reduction in in terrestrial animals. Um, South Australia is also moving along. They've got quite. A, in, I'm based in Adelaide in South Australia. Australia, South Australia's always had a fairly progressive sort of aquaculture uh, industry. We have a good Aquaculture Act. It's, the government's very supportive of aquaculture in South Australia. So, again, there's been 50 approvals for, for seaweed farming um, granted so far in, in South Australia. CH4 Global, who uh, we'll talk later on, they also have a presence in, in South Australia and doing research and developing um, asparagus farming in South Australia, but there's there's a few other smaller players um, in South Australia. Um, there's a little shellfish hatchery, air shellfish, which are, are growing as, asparagopsis as well. They're experimenting with that in the, well, the hatchery phase of it. And one of our indigenous groups on the York Peninsula, just across from, from Adelaide, the Narunga Nation uh, Aboriginal Corporation, have. Uh, also got leases and approvals for growing growing seaweed, and have um, talking with uh, CH4 about you know relationships and joint ventures and that that sort of thing. But um, and then we have others that are like the tuna farmers, Dinko um, Seafood, uh, a lady that runs it, Lucina Lucan. She she's very progressive, looking at other options other than tuna, and you know they're looking at just simply putting out long lines seeing what seaweed grows on them, 
and then just harvesting those long lines and using the seaweed for you know soil stimulants or whatever products they can get from you know so skipping the whole hatchery bit and just using what what grows there naturally and seasonally in new south wales there's other um there's a little bit of water being allocated down sort of south of sydney um and they're looking at another you know 260 hectares um, development there. And, nor you know, nor so north of that, they have, um, we have a, a long established um, on-land seaweed farm, uh, FOCO Health, a lady named Pia Winberg has been a long time um, seaweed entrepreneur, if you like. She's worked on seaweed for decades and is very knowledgeable and has, if you can have a look at her website and the range of products she produces from seaweeds. Uh, she produces a lot of health related um, and food products from, from the, the seaweed she grows, which is beside a uh, ethanol sort of commercial ethanol producer and they pipe off the, the CO2 from that facility into the her on land tank. So she's got a, a ready supply of CO2 to enrich her, the water she grows her seaweed in which is a, a pretty good little setup. Um, Western Australia, uh, they've just put out a seaweed policy for seaweed farming in Western Australia. Um, and they have a few licenses. And we have another company called uh, Sea Stock. Um, so for producing asparagopsis and selling it for the purpose of reducing methane in terrestrial animals, we need to get a, a permit from <coughs> the people that hold the patents for that. Uh, technology, so that's uh, Future Feeds, and so we, in Australia we've got Sea Stock, um, CH4, and Sea Forest are, are all licensed or permitted through um, Future Feeds to uh, use their products for that that purpose. So, um, and in Queensland, we also have, there's been a lot of work in Queensland on seaweed for a long time, but a lot of that's been around the bioremediation uses of seaweed, so particularly in um, prawn farming, and it's continuing now. Um, you know, we're having an expansion of prawn farming. I deal with the prawn farmers as well. And, you know, the, that industry has grown 20% each year for the last three years. It's gone from $86 million three, four years ago to over $200 million in this financial year. So but one of the limitations they have is they're, you know, most of the farms are off on the coast and off the coast is the Great Barrier Reef. So there's a lot of uh, environmental regulations around discharge of, of water from prawn farms. And because they're a point source of discharge, they're a, they're a pretty easy target for uh, environmental regulation. So the only way they can grow is to try to find ways to reduce or maintain or keep under their nutrient discharge caps that they have. One of them is around looking at, you know, how do they remove nitrogen and phosphorus from their discharge water. So we've just started a, uh, a project with um, one of the major farms up there that is um, owned by Tassau, a salmon farm from um, Tasmania, which is now owned by Cook Agriculture as of a few months ago. So we've had a project that's been running with them for about nine months and up to date they've removed over two and a half thousand tonnes of seaweed from their effluent pond. Their biggest problem now is what they're going to do with two and a half thousand tonnes of seaweed. So they're a bit ahead of schedule. That was supposed to only happen in a 18 months into the project. Now they've just got mountains. I think it's, it'll probably get over 4,000 tonnes by the end of the year of, uh, of seaweed. So. Um, Victoria, again, there's interest in Victoria, and each of these states typically have a university that has some sort of established expertise in, in seaweed farming, or, or seaweed biology or phycology, and now it's, you know, we're trying to, a lot of that is pivoting towards supporting uh, the interest in, in seaweed aquaculture. So what we have in, in Australia are these, uh, you know, long-term research funding um, arrangements called uh, cooperative research centres. They're traditionally, they are, they have to be industry-led. They provide funds for research programs that go out to 10 years. 
So that's, uh, you know, typically with research, if you, you're in research, you might be lucky to get a three-year project or maybe a five-year project if you're really lucky. But these are designed for, for 10 years. So we have two going. You probably heard one if you're at the aquaculture conference in the last two days. John Whittington described the Blue Economy CRC. That's a, you know, that has total sort of cash and in-kind value of about $328 million. The government's putting in $70 million of that, but that's all about blue economy stuff. And, but part of that in there is, is seaweed. And that's, to, you know, really their remit is looking at the offshore production of, of, of seaweed. So, so it's not all of that money, but a part of that investment in the blue economy CRC is definitely around seaweed. The other one that's recently been funded uh, about 12 months ago is what we call the Blue Economy CRC. Again, quite a big um, investment. You know, it's about $59 million of government money, plus the research partners, industry partners and in-kind contributions makes it all add up to about $268 million over 10 years. And that is really targeted around... Um, a lot of it is about seaweed, but it's about all the products you can get from... Um, stuff from the sea. So that's about production and it's also a lot of the effort is around extraction and what are the products and, and how do you get value out of the stuff you grow. So I'm with FRDC, so we fund, have been funding smaller projects. We invest in some of these, uh, these CRCs with our industry partners. But you know, we've done, you know, along the way just sort of shorter time projects. So we're tending to find that we are getting called upon, you know, like within these big CRCs, the interest is on the, the science and the technology and the, you know, the sexy sort of seaweed stuff. But we are looking at, you know, what are the impediments for the regulators? Because the regulators are really trying to catch up, you know, like they are set up to, um, to provide licenses and permits for the sectors that they know for oyster farmers, for you know salmon farmers, for prawn farmers. So they don't know much about seaweed farming. So there's information gaps that the regulators need, and that's the sort of research we're trying to plug in at the moment. Is you know what do they need? Uh, what what do they need to know about the biosecurity risks around seaweed, the genetic risks when they start, you know, doing selective breeding of seaweed for stuff we need for a, a commercial seaweed is going to be different eventually to what is in the wild. It's going to start to diverge and there's going to be genetics, that sort of, those sort of information gaps we're trying to support research on. Um, and um, so there's a, a list of the, the projects we've, we've done directly. One of them that at the moment we're looking at is the top one is about, you know, how do you assess the biomass of seaweeds that uh, a farmer wants to when they're initially setting up, they want to go and harvest um, seaweed from the wild. Um, so the regulators want to know about how, to, how do they manage that for, you know, the short term. Well, hopefully that'll only last for, you know, three to five years and then we'll have all of the seaweed being farmed will come from hatcheries. So um, another group that's involved in funding is AgriFutures Australia. Their role, they're another research and development corporation in Australia, but they tend to try to establish or promote uh, you know, new emerging agriculture businesses. So that might be, and small sectors, you know, it might be honeybees, it might be quinoa, or it might be, um, you know, any of those smaller industries. Okay, so, um, but what we find is that what we also need is all of these groups don't talk to each other. So um, Blue Economy don't really understand what, uh, marine byproducts are doing. They don't un and uh, they don't understand what FRDC is doing, and FRDC don't talk to AgriFutures. So, and then we also have ACIR, who are our international aid group that also funds seaweed groups. So there's all this, you know, research funders that are being approached, and don't understand what each of the each what we are um, collectively being asked to look at to fund. So. FRDC is trying to play a role in, you know, getting those groups to all meet regularly, discuss what seaweed projects have been uh, approached to look at, and see, you know, who are the best um, 
you know, options to, to fund that and make sure it's not being duplicated and how that information is, is shared between all of, the, uh, all of the funding groups and all of the industry players. So, um, so to, to help that, we have a Australian Fisheries Management Forum, which is all of the aquaculture regulators for every state meet, you know, three, four times a year, and they have a seaweed working group now, which is just discussing how they, each of the aquaculture managers in each state, which luckily in New Zealand you don't have all that level of government to deal with, but we have all these states that, you know, within Australia. Um, so we try to get them to talk to each other and, you know, they can share information about how they are tackling managing um, seaweed aquaculture development. And um, we also have the, the Industry Association, which has been formed, the Australian Seaweed, uh, Sustainable Seaweed Association. And they now have 45 members, 10 corporates, 35 affiliate members. But I guess my messages are, you know, essentially there's a lot of interest and a lot of investment in going into seaweed research in Australia, but it's, it's very poorly, um, it's fragmented. And, it's, and it needs to be better coordinated. So we're trying to play a role in doing that. Um, and I guess backing up what Bren said, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for the, the foundation knowledge um, that each, you know, New Zealand and Australia are probably tackling the same um, knowledge gaps. And, you know, there's opportunities, I think, to, um, to collaborate at that non-competitive level. Okay, and oh, I'm, I think I'm getting the wind up. But last plug, um, next year in February, FRDC is a sponsor of the uh, International Seaweed Symposium. That'll be in Hobart next February, uh, all about seaweed. Um, I'm imagining that'll be a very well attended event. And also keeping in mind that um, in um, June next year, there will be the uh, World Aquaculture is coming to Darwin in the, the Northern Territory. So it's for wider aquaculture interest. Yeah, unfortunately, I think they, they crossed out New Zealand off the, the map there. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, thank you.